We had Mark Jabbar a moment ago, but I had trouble with turning his music off. So <laughs> he'll be back in a moment, I think. Here he is. Holy shit, what happened to you? Yeah, well, I, I uh, fell over onto the pavement, if you can imagine that. And, uh, oh, no, Jeffrey. And uh, I damaged uh, part of my face. It's got a big black eye, so. Oh, man. Yeah. No yeah, damage done, though. Did, did you go see no, a doctor? No, I did go see. I went, I, well, I, they took me to the hospital right away because they were worried about concussion, but uh, um, I didn't have any concussion, so measurable concussion anyway. So, I'm so sorry. So it was an eventful weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you got a poem out of it. <laughs> Maybe not a very good one, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so are you feeling well enough to I'm feeling well enough to do this, yeah. It's just that my eye, because it's sort of half shut by the by the bump, it's weeping all the time, which is really annoying. So, um, but it doesn't stop me talking. So, <laughs> <laughs> you look a little bit like a superhero. <laughs> and why is that? I was just kind of as if you're mutating and, and the eye is going to develop <laughs> superpower. You, you, you know, like the Incredibles with the black <laughs> eye uh, things. Yeah, yeah. So I need the other one to match the first one and then, then it'll be perfect, right? This is just the first <laughs> I don't know if we need to just start in and, and catch people as they come in. I don't know if anybody else was coming in, but... Uh... Maybe we could get started. What do you think? Let's see. A couple of minutes after, Katina had indicated that she might join us, but then I saw some of the conversation where she expressed some reservation about uh, participating in video format. Yeah. yeah. Talk about audio versus video and hearing the voice versus <clears throat> the distraction potentially or as experienced of. Um, of you know, faces on the screen, which I think is a, a legitimate concern and um, I think an interesting thing to discuss. But yeah. that may be why, why, why she's not here. I don't know, speculating. Hi, Doug. Hello. Greetings. How's everyone? Good. Fine. Aside from my black Not eye. Not the worst for wear. <laughs> <laughs> Is this related to the, the poem that you just posted? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> gotcha. I, I got the gist of it. I'm sure you've already discussed it. So. <laughs> I had hoped you might have been recounting something that happened years ago. <laughs> but... No, it was very, very recent. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a, more an appearance thing. It's like I don't really want to go to the grocery grocery store because I, I don't want to. I don't want to have to deal with people's stares. But you know, I dark, mean, obviously, dark glasses. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's it. That's, that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> No, uh, that's a signal of spousal abuse. <laughs> well, I noted at the hospital that they were very careful to sort of explain whenever they retold it to somebody, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I had an accident in, in, the, in the kitchen once on my wrist. I cut my wrist. And I went to the emergency room, and everyone assumed I had attempted suicide. <laughs> yeah. So, they so why like, did you go to the emergency room? <laughs> right, right. And they had all, and they every time they repeated it to somebody, another expert 
came to offer me some guidance. And I was like, no, 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 I don't want to commit suicide. I'm fine. I just, <laughs> but I understand they probably just want to like be certain about something like that. <laughs> See why liabilities as well. I can, if they were not to check and then, you know, something were to happen. C-Y-A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, you know, they're called upon to make very quick judgments about things. So I think that's, it extends into other parts of, you know, they get into trouble because, of course, uh, I know, well, I imagine that the same applies to dealing with blacks, for instance, in hospitals. But here, indigenous peoples get very badly treated in hospitals because it's assumed they're drunk when they're not. Uh, and uh, because they make these really fast judgments. And uh, so I did feel humbled by the experience that way. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I, do, I wasn't hit, but I could imagine somebody who had been hit and, and the experience that would, would lead to, you know, I thought it was kind of an interesting awareness kind of thing. Well, I'll start by reading, um, have a short excerpt from one of my writings um, that dates back to the era when I wrote some of this other material on quantum poetics. So it's a fiction text that I wrote, <clears throat> just a small excerpt. Um, I am inspired by your passions, your madness, your sorrow, Man that I am, I share my lights with humanity, my secrets, I protect the sacred places of anger. I bury half of my body in the prima, primordial terror, the dance with the black knives, macabre and dangerous. Vagabond, if I attach you to the earth, would I have your gratitude or your hate? You are paradoxical and I incarnate. These are the two sides of our friendship. I confront every moment your death with mine. You die in my past and my future, and at every moment I die also. That it is at the beginning or at the end, my own death serves as boundary conditions. All the harmonics of my intelligence are only manifestations of these fixed points Without you, I would never be more than a probabilistic wave in an imaginary space. So, um, I'm not gonna say anything more about it, but may, may come back to it later. I'm gonna start by saying a few words about what we think, what we mean by quantum poetics or quantum field poetics, as I've started to call it. Um, <clears throat> so originally, Catherine Hales proposed, in 1984, proposed three properties for what she called field poetics. Interconnectedness, continuity, and self-referentiality. Uh, and uh, Heather pointed me out to, it's in one of her three references that she put up for today's uh, talk, uh, a, a talk given by Lise Jarnot, uh, who added a fourth property to the idea of field poetics, which is the idea of boundedness. So we have four properties for fields that can apply in the context of poetics. Um, here's the description that Heather and I have sort of converged towards in our various discussions. <clears throat> Quantum po poetics can be viewed in general terms as referring to the notion that text can be viewed as activating a broad field of meaning and resonance, itself grounded in day-to-day -day experience, and that attending to both the text itself and its associated field can be productive. We identify three aspects of experience that form the poetic or experiential field, the felt, 
the spiritual and the ineffable. So that's kind of, uh, it, it's couched in non-physical terms, if you like. It's more about the uh, general ideas of what's going on. The nuance between field poetics and quantum poetics is that the latter draws more heavily on some of the analogies between quantum field theory and literary theory that I have been drawing out. And that refers more to the text that I posted. Um, but both function in the sense of looking at meaning uh, in its relation to metaphor, semantic fields, and also argument and resonance in uh, association with ideas like alliteration, internal rhyming, repetition, onomatopoeia, etc., as field effects. In particular, the different ways that structures, paragraphs, internally enhanced patterns, poetic verses, etc., may be used to generate or enhance field effects. Um, so a kind of boundary condition in the context of text. In physics, in quantum physics, the fields are, it was a bit complicated to, to explain, but the, a wavy equation, which is a probabilistic formulation of, of the physics, is solved in mathematical terms by imposing boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions generate structures in the result. So the idea in, in correspondence to the text is that by imposing structures on the text on a level semantic field, you generate additional structures that wouldn't necessarily be evident without the structures. And so it's this parallel that we're drawing between what's going on in quantum physics and what's going on in, in literary fields. Um, we'll get into more the the your questions and discussion about these issues. So there's been some of it already on the site uh, in in the exchange with Ed. Um, but I just want to give a brief idea about where this came from, where these concepts came from in my own life. And then Heather will give her own take on this uh, in terms of how it ties in with her own interests. So, in 19, so it dates back to my PhD uh, in 1987, which was in astrophysics, in which I was trained in both quantum physics and general relativity, among other things. And my thesis was focused on the large scale structure of the universe. So <clears throat> the clustering of galaxies and so forth and at the largest scales of the universe, that was what my PhD was focused on. In 1989, well, in 1988 to 1999, I wrote and then published in 1989, a text that I called The Poetic Field echoes from a scientist. It was published in a Quebec literary journal. Um, so my PhD was in astrophysics, but before I did my PhD and even my master's, I hesitated between a career as a writer and I, I, I did part of my degree program in English literature. And I tried to get the university to agree that I do a double degree, one in English literature and one in, in astrophysics. But the university refused to let me do it. They said, you do one or the other, or you go back to school and you redo all the four years, uh, and then you do your second degree that way. But they wouldn't give me the single, the possibility of doing two degrees in such disparate fields. They've since changed the rules, but of course it was far too late for me. So that's why in a sense, I already had this sensitivity towards poetry and writing before I did my degree. And, and this is partly why these two threads got mixed up in my own life. So over the, the three years following 1989, when I published this text, I drafted the three quantum poetics papers, which are, the, one is the one that I, we put up, two is the one I put up in response to 
Doug's question, and there's a third one which is much more fragmentary, fragmentary than the first two. But I, was, I needed a partner who was a researcher in English literature in order to ground the, I felt I needed a partner in English literature in order to ground the text on the English literature side in order to get it published. And I was un unable to find one, even though I tried several times with different people that I had met and, and contacted, but uh, it wasn't, nobody was really interested in the subject in those days. Um, it was the, I was the first one, I, if I had published the quantum poetics paper, even one of them, I probably would have been credited as being the first person to use the term quantum poetics because it's since been used by all sorts of people. But because mine was unpublished, <clears throat> you know, and there's no way to establish this sort of credit there. Um, I co-wrote and published with my wife, Clarisse Tremblay, who was a, an award-winning poet, a second article called, in English translation, Towards the Geometry of the Intimate, Poetry and Science Meet in 1999. <clears throat> it followed a long conversation we had while driving between Stockholm and the ferry to Denmark um, about the relationship between science and poetry. My wife died of cancer that same year and over the next through several years I threw myself into my career as a scientist and uh, all of the literature stuff sort of fell by the way, wayside during that period. In 2012, I was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea and took time off work. And that's when I started the novel, the science fiction opus, uh, as a way to fill up the time that uh, I had on sitting around at home and not, not being able to work much. Uh, so this year, during one of the minor gesture meters, meetings, Heather mentioned that she was doing some work on quantum poetics. So you can imagine my surprise when I heard this term come back at me 30 years later. And uh, she had a connection through another researcher, poet, writer, uh, Amy Cantanzano, I think that's right. Um, and uh, so I quickly followed up with Heather and that's when we developed this series of video chats in order to try and understand how the ideas that I developed could be combined with her own interests in order to develop something that um, is uh, a kind of collaborative experience. Um, it quickly became apparent that there were openings towards a more practical approach from the ideas that I originally developed which tend to be a little bit theoretical. Uh, I think that's part of what Ed was talking about. Um, but um, we're trying to bring it back to a practice of writing and how it can form a, a practice of writing. Um, there are also cross connections between the ideas of quantum poetics and Gebserian thought. So I've been reading Gebser. I've finally managed to read through the first 150 pages of Gebser. So I'm not an expert, but I, I can see some of the co connections, especially in relation to his idea of a perspectivity, <clears throat> as well as other field approaches such as Whitehead's writings or um, Aaron Manning's for that matter in the minor gesture. Um, finally, we realized quite quickly um, that the quantum poetics approach could be, you, could be interesting as a way of supporting collective writing activities because this idea of using, having a conscious way to develop and enhance phenomena through writing lends itself to a collective process as well. So, um, so that's a, a, an added bonus to this way of doing things. So I think that covers the, the list of things that I had laid out and I'll pass the baton to Heather to do the next little bit. Thank you, Jeffrey. I am struck uh, just listening to your timeline and I know it's eclipsed, it's not a full timeline. I know you were gonna select from, instead of to tell your whole life story, <laughs> <laughs> select a few things, but I, I'm just struck by the, uh, the depth of this exploration and the, 
uh, passion that's gone into it amongst other things but yeah that's uh, I'm left with a good aftertaste hearing you talk about it um, I will also start with a short reading and then just give a few outlines an outline of a few ideas and uh, then I believe we have some time for discussion and then a practice ahead on the call so I posted a draft of this um, and a poem that came out of the prose portion to um, the Cosmos Cafe page for today. And I'll read, the, it's just two pages, double spaced. Um, I'll read it in full. A Quantum Glimpse from a Novel in Progress. There was no way to know if letters laid down in a linear fashion inside a book were rooted in a deeper place in the dream, but it could be felt and was true. The unchanging surfaces, each trace fingered neatly on the page, were mirages, shimmering, imperceptibly shifting shape beyond the gaze. Their little black feet wet the threshold of another world, one without the familiar forms of this one. Visible shapes floated on the surface of a sea without shores, and each letter pulled with its fragments of breath like the breeze above the waves, free and fluid. The winds moved through their graceful and tiny curves, suspended at the base of sharp angles before finding release. These gusts fanned the black fire in the letters, and between them was the white fire, an invisible space that pulsated with desire, absence, and incomplete passion. The white fire was an invisible substance where precision crystallized, where form grasped hold, grasped hold and emerged steadily supported by its quietly burning need. The white fire fed the black fire, supported it in space and on the page, gave it an anchor and a linear flow. These spaces may have seemed unimportant, random even, but in them lie the invisible lines of connection. In them were the seeds. They were part of the fabric of all life. Each letter was held in the meshwork of paper and pulp that seemed utilitarian and accidental, an afterthought, chosen as the medium, the material for the mysterium. But the letters moving toward their holes in the space beyond the book, before the book, behind the book, swirled their essences together, felt their pull toward the arc of the whole book. Their joined purpose was a mirror that they found themselves in. The word essences stayed in place on the page, but roved silently inside the space of words and paragraphs shifting meanings and interpretations, perhaps only slightly at times, or with great force at others. They waited and knew they would be read. They knew by whom. They waited and knew they held a power, a power of arrangement, a power found in minds, an awareness of change, like transmuting one element to another. The letter and word roots dug into the amber of potential outside of time. They drew their collective breaths, from this thick bath and vibrated tensely in the endless planes of thought that intersected and ran through their delicate forms. Each pair of eyes fueled with a deeper light that found them, reminded them of how they had been caressed in the past, how they had been loved, needed, revered, even encanted. This was what it meant to know. All intelligence, all lines intelligent, the letter and words knew. And so um, in a workshop, the feedback I got was that that was a bit wordy. <laughs> so I condensed it to a poem of about that many words, which I'll read next, just for contrast. Also called a quantum glimpse. Black feet threshold of another world. A sea without shores. Fragments above the waves. Find release in invisible space. Where precision crystallized paper and pulp a mirror they found themselves in, the amber of potential, delicate forms outside of time. So I don't know if it's clear from that uh, couple of pieces, if the, from those couple of pieces, but um, Kabbalah was really my introduction to what we might call field poetics. I worked with a Jewish teacher um, and I started having a bunch of experiences with language on the page in particular and in, the uh, Jewish mystical tradition, there is a uh, precedent of the white and the black fire, which I mentioned in that first piece on the, in the Torah. And each letter in the scroll is significant and the placement of each letter in the scroll. And to me, that was actually a quantum principle 
And so that was my first encounter with the way these things intersect. So I wrote that piece more from the experience of encountering language that way, or a whole text. When we talk about a field, we might mean the poem, we might mean the book it's in, we might mean the author's whole body of work. A field, like Jeffrey mentioned earlier, is bounded. Um, and then when I went to Naropa in 2015, which I wrote this while I was at Naropa, but I, I went to Naropa after studying with a Jewish teacher and uh, discovered more about the field poetics tradition that was already there. One of our first readings um, helped me experience it. It was a book called Beast Feast by Cody Rose Clevidence. And the book itself could only be understood as an arc through which various threads wafted and ghosted could be pulled through. Um, the book itself explored transgender identity and the cry at zero or the, uh, the wound that is written from. And so the book itself was an opening and gave it that field quality. And so that was my first experience of tasting what field poetics really was. And then we started reading some poetic theory in my intro class. We read some Charles Olson, which I did post a link to, his uh, 1950 piece on projective verse, which is also considered a composition by field essay. 1950, so this is significant that he was attuned, I think, in this way. Um, he, a quote from this piece, first some simplicities that a man learns. If he works in open, or what can also be called composition by field, as opposed to inherited line stanza overall form, what is the old base, which is the old base of the non-projective? Then he's attuned to the kinetics of the thing, the principle of the thing, the process of the thing. And of course, he's referring to uh, the masculine pronoun here, but um, he also says, any poet who departs from closed form is specially confronted by a problem, and it involves a whole series of new recognitions. From the moment he ventures into field composition, puts himself in the open, he can go by no track other than the one the poem underhand declares for itself. Thus he has to behave and be instant by instant aware of some several forces just now beginning to be examined. It is much more, for example, this push than simply such a one as pound put so wisely to get us started the musical phrase, go by it boys, rather than by the metronome. So the poem itself dictates the composition in field poetics. Marco's referenced a few things kind of like that, the, feel, the you know, feeling the ripening of the next line, not, not his words, those are mine. Um, so also the, um, uh, there was something else I was gonna say about that, but, oh, projective verse then involves the breath because um, he is actually talking about a process of projection onto the page. And he studied Jung. He was um, quite a mystic, Olson was. He started the Black Mountain Arts School, which has a lot of postmodern, has started a lot of postmodern uh, trends and traditions in the field of writing. And then Lynn Hygienian comes along, and this is in the 80s, and she's writing about the open text, which is also an expression of this, um, maybe an evolution of the thinking. This is in 1983, she first gave this, and a quick description of it, the difference between a closed text, which allows for a single interpretation, and an open text where all the elements of the work are maximally excited, in her words, and multiple readings or interpretations become available. Hygienian then goes on to list a few techniques that open a text, arrangement and rearrangement, repetition and compositional techniques, resulting in gaps in the text, which must be filled in by the reader. In emphasizing the reader's role, writing as process and the political implications of both, Hygienian's essay articulates many of the main goals and concerns of the language movement. So she was um, at the end of the language movement or one of the schools of language poetry. But um, the shift to field awareness was really a part of her work as well. And Jeffrey referenced a talk that I linked to the forum by Lisa Jarno, who studied Robert Duncan, and he's another field poetics person. And he believed that the poem is an ill-kept garden that has an organic unfolding, uh, where the gods come into the field of the poem and alter the kinetics of the thing. 
he described a field of force um, altered by the introduction of new objects into that field. And Lisa goes on to, she gives the Michael Faraday definition of from field theory, his field theory condition, uh, field is a condition in space, which has the potential to produce a force, has boundaries and objects and potential for forces between objects. And she also talks about Whitehead, as Jeffrey mentioned, um, and her interpretation of, of Whitehead, Jeffrey had some questions around, but um, it ultimately adds up to looking a lot like what we get as projective identification or projection from the psychoanalysts like Melanie Klein. So Olson wrote four years um, after Melanie Klein identified projective identification as a psychological phenomenon having to do with attachment theory. And um, Olson thought that introjection, which is this more interior uh, projection or working with them, it's a, he saw it as an aggressive move and he called it the sprawl. So these are ways that these poets have worked with field poetics um, and some of their influences, which had to do with the psyche. And uh, Jarno goes on to explain that um, things like alliteration or simultaneity, simultaneity of a pattern arising in the field is an expression of field poetics. Um, an example would be like a Jackson Pollock painting. She gives that example where there's no direction to how you look at it. You can enter it at any point and the composition is not directive. It's non-hierarchical. It's a process, but not a, but progress would be a ludicrous term. And she gives some examples on the page as well. Uh, she also says that with um, quantum poetics or field poetics, rather she's using that term, we have parallels. There's never one thing that's happening in the field. And we have things like time and folds that um, open the field or our way of interacting with it. And uh, linguistic patterns and syllable structures are some of those interactions. So uh, that was a little theoretical. I apologize um, for diving into some of the source material itself. It's there for you to read if you want to revisit. Didn't catch um, anything I said, but. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what this means for you all, um, what, how you connect with it, and uh, maybe any questions too that are coming up around the topic. And Jeffrey, if you have anything else to add too, I'll pause. Well, just that we're going to, uh, I th Heather, you'll keep tra track of the time maybe, and uh, half an hour before the end, we're going to um, break off the discussion and lead you into an exercise. Um, and half an hour and before the end is, one o'clock is that right uh, is it one o'clock is it one and a half hours normally so yeah i think that's right um yeah, we we often go two two hours personally i i prefer one and a half hours or i'm coming to prefer it because uh, by two hours i start to get tired but that's just me yeah uh, but our we have been main, mostly doing two hours so well you... let's aim for one and if the conversation at after the exercise continues a, a bit that'll be fine too mm -hmm. great so are you inviting conversation now yes mm -hmm. i would like to say a few words um i don't know what they're going what they're going to be <laughs> but um I have a kind of cluster of reactions or responses or impressions from, from what you all shared. My cluster is not directly related, but it's, it's in, in this, in this set, same sense of a field, I think it's in the same field or it's, it's in a parallel field or, or, or something like that. And I think it's important to um, identify maybe where I feel that I resonate and where I feel that I'm still confused or where things are unclear. Um, for example, the, the papers, I um, felt baffled by, in, in, not in a bad way, in, in just the, the sense that, that there's something for me to learn, uh, that I don't understand quantum physics. Uh, I have a layman's understanding at best, and maybe not even that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming to, um, to sense. But everything, when, when you do distill it down and when you read and um, 
highlight the places where, where text or textuality or the reading experience or the writing experience um, mirror these uh, principles or these features of the quantum, uh, again, which I have a fuzzy idea about. And uh, I suppose that's part of the point is that it is inherently fuzzy, but I, I don't have an, an educated idea about, I think, in the way that Jeffrey as an a astrophysicist, you know, you certainly do. You, there's the sense that, you know, mathematics that I don't know and have a trained way of thinking about physical reality that um, you can draw upon to draw these correlations. But um, in the, to the degree that I'm able to register uh, a coherence to the concept, uh, I feel extremely aligned with it. And it, it seems to express, um, it seems to be theorizing um, what I feel I've been doing implicitly uh, all this time with the cosmos project and the infinite conversations and metapsychosis and a theory of everybody and then my, my own personal poetics. Uh, I think it's all been about creating fields and meta fields and other terms that we haven't even brought in, but spheres is another way of uh, Sloterdijk um, shows thinking about these collective spaces and these spaces of intersection. And I, I know that for my, for, I, and I see all these projects as poetic at their root, as essentially poetic. Uh, although there are other aspects and economic, political, social, and so forth, uh, my desire is that those would be enfolded within a poetic uh, expression, ultimately, that they would be taken into that, um, that movement. And so I find it very, um, I find it very in interesting and encouraging that you're, at, you're thinking through the details of what that would entail in theoretical terms and in practical terms. Because I think that what we've been doing here has been practical. We've been enacting the very field that we're theorizing. And these namespaces or these um, boundary conditions, I think, as you put, you put it, uh, which um, contract in a way and kind of constellate or attract attention and then generate texts generate dialogue as you and Heather have done, as we've done in the, the cafes, of, as we've also done with the reading groups. Uh, I see them, each of these clusters, these intensities of, of uh, interaction, uh, playing against each other and influencing each other. Uh, and when I imagine it, of course, the cosmos metaphor, I, I think that happens in, in ways that um, have astrophysical uh, metaphorics implicit. So it, 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 it's, it's delightful to me that, uh, that we could have discussions about something like quantum poetics and we could be actually um, inquiring into how science and art um, really could uh, um, have a meaningful a meaningful and pr and creative relationship with each other, uh, uh, a healthy relationship, let's say, um, productive relationship. Uh, I think that that is happening, and it's a bit messy because we're all, we're all sort of learning and catching up, and and it's a I forgot how Heather put it, but something about a, a garden, unweeded garden. I I uh, I I think that um, that's what we're doing. That's what this is. That's uh, part of what the vitality of it is that, um, that fecundity of the field that we are constituting through our, um, through our sharing and our interactions and our, and our respective uh, poetics, which, uh, which find each other and, um, 
and recreate. So uh, I really appreciate this uh, inquiry and this, this dialogue. And uh, I'm, I'm honored as well to be working with you a little bit, just beginning to, uh, ahead of the Gebser conference where we'll be presenting on this theme. And I'm just kind of a week into feeling my way into how I even uh, can, con can kind of concretize that. But fortunately, we have some time to do that. And um, one last thought is that uh, I think that part of how this process works is that it is a revelatory process. And, and I, I, I would um, argue that it is progressive, not just processual. Uh, and it's progressive in the sense that like a television is progressive when it renders the electromat, you know, electrical signals into an image. Um, it has a way of doing that, that the pixels, uh, as they become defined, progressively reveal the image. So that the image unfolds from that cloud of electrons. Uh, I think that part of what we're doing is similar to that. And that as we each kind of bring, clarify and define our pixels and the clouds constellate in particular ways, which of course is dynamic, that progressively images are revealed, progressively uh, a sense of the whole or a sense of where the whole is going uh, becomes apparent. So I, f I find this to be a, a stimulating pixel in, in, in the cosmic panorama. And thank you for that. Can I ask just two uh, questions for clarification? Sure can. Um, one is for Hester and one is for Marco. In, in Hester, when you were describing open and closed texts. You said that a closed text, according to one author, I, don't, I didn't catch the name, um, was one that had just a single interpretation. Do you have an example of a text like that? Yeah. Uh, so she offers some in this article, if you wanted to look at it later, the one I linked um, as a, it's just a link. Um, Let's see, it says here, it does give several examples, even in the beginning, but we're essentially looking at the old uh, form poetry would be um, one way to understand a closed text. Let's see. Uh, who's, who's the author? In, so I get, oh. I get the right uh, one? Yeah, it's Lynn Hygienian, H-E-J-I-N-I-A-N. Oh, okay. And she, here's a quote from the intro to it. In the rejection of closure, she says, Lynn. I give no examples of a closed text in that uh, talk, but I can offer several. The coercive epiphanic model in some contemporary lyric poetry can serve as a negative model with its smug pretension to universality and its tendency to cast the poet as guardian to truth. And detective fiction can serve as a positive model presenting an ultimately stable, calm and calming and fundamentally unepiphanic vision of the world. In either case, however, pleasurable its effects, closure is a fiction, one of the amenities that falsehood and fantasy provide. So I thought that was well put. I found it more interesting to dwell with what closed and open might be, um, just kind of to use the, after reading her piece, just to use it mm -hmm. as a question. Oh, okay, thanks. Someone even asked the question, what would an open pedagogy look like? So I think taking uh, her piece and then expanding the question is an interesting experiment. Yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree that it is because I, I haven't ever encountered the text that was only liable to one interpretation. Absolutely. That does seem like a, a grand statement. However, I do like what she's yeah, saying. That, that, that's the part that caught me about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like what she's saying about the guardian of truth. I certainly know that kind of I, that, that part I understand. I can I can follow that and that, that makes a certain amount of sense. You know, it's, yeah. Sometimes we say a lot of things. I know I'm guilty of this, right, Jeffrey? Of making him a brash statements of fact that actually have no basis in anything. You know, but um, but they're there to get you to explore and to get us to think about things. You know, that's yeah. that's the part that I that I appreciate. So thank you very I much. I don't. 
Yeah, I don't have a negative reaction to closed text per se. However, um, where I am given rules and told this is the only way and I feel a more alive process underneath that, that's where mm -hmm. I would want to resort to open. And then I also think of the Zen not knowing uh, the way she's describing open here. It's, it's more like a... I've know. always anyway, considered rules as guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to know what, what some people think so that you can bend them um, appropriately, especially for their own, their own good. Or resonate with them, yeah, if it's useful. Or that, yeah, as yeah. well. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that. The other one was yeah. from Marco, because he said that all of his projects are poetic. And, and, I, and I think I know what you mean. But I'll say it very bluntly, I have no idea what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, do, what do you actually mean by that? that, that, that it, in 25 words or less. <laughs> you know, I, I mean that if, if you were to um, take a, a God's eye perspective, kind of from beyond the earth, look down <laughs> upon all, 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 all this. What, a cosmic that, perspective, that, perhaps? Yes, that, 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 you would, <laughs> that, what, that there would be a, a, a rhyme and reason for how mm. things are arranged. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I, I think the phraseology rhyme and reason makes it. That, that, that <laughs> okay. All right. That was the question. Although, although one could argue, I mean, I'm sort of adding to fuel to the fire maybe, but uh, um, because we didn't, we talked about field, but we didn't talk about what poetics is. Uh, and, and, and in my perspective, poetics is any text that aims to enhance internal resonances within the text. Uh, so, you know, these, some of these ideas that I talked about, alliteration, onomatopoeia, these, cause, these are all internal connections between text. Uh, and, and all of Infinite Conversations is redolent with internal connections going on, internal resonances going on between the different things. So I agree, I think it is poetic, but I, according to my definition of poetics. Well, I, I, that's a nice addition, Jeffrey. Well, I, I would just wanna go back briefly to the question Ed, you asked Heather. Um, one, to highlight an internal resonance, one difference, I think, uh, or one example, let's say, uh, of a difference between a, um, an open and a closed text would be uh, the difference between allegory and, and symbol. And we had a discussion about this in relation to the movie Mother by uh, the director, Darren Aronofsky, because some argued in this discussion that we had, and we had a couple of discussions actually, and. Bridget Burke wrote a, um, a paper on it, uh, and all divergent perspectives on, on the same film, but some argued that there was a clear allegorical structure to the film, and that the film wanted to be read as an allegory of the Bible, where the characters played the roles of God and um, uh, Jesus and the earth and, and, and so forth, uh, Cain and Abel. If that were the case, I would argue that is a kind of closed or a more closed. I wouldn't be absolute open or closed, but if we imagined a shading or a degrees of openness or clo closure, uh, if the text wanted you to read it uh, in terms of another text only, um, that would be closed. On the extreme end of closed would be something like an instruction manual or uh, a a, a dogma or a military command. I mean, there are kinds of texts uh, that really demand, um, and not just by themselves, but by virtue of the humans who carry them and uh, enact them, demand certain interpretations very strongly and, and not others. The other, the, you know, the other end of that spectrum would be the more open, and that would be the uh, the, what J.F. Martel, who was a participant in those mother conversations, called symbol. Now, you'd have to get into his whole idea to, to go into what he means by symbol, but basically, it's an open um, sign. It's it's an open sign. It's an open um, 
invitation into into a non a non random it it's 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 tied to the symbol itself but it is open to diverse and generative interpretations uh, and has a kind of inexhaustibility to it uh, that's you know have various features we could talk about i think and, and perhaps those intersects intersect with the quantum that quantum realm of undifferentiated potentiality that sense that a text or a field can express or liberate that undifferentiated potentiality and bring it into a uh, you know bring it to perception uh, so just some thoughts on 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 that question yeah i wanted to offer one more uh Thing, not to just read quotes, but I love how Lynn says this about a closed text, and it might clear up a few things when we're talking about degrees of openness or closure. She says, um, we can say that a closed text, and she says this is a tentative characterization, but it's one that all in which all the elements of the work are directed toward a single reading of it. Each element confirms the reading and delivers the text from any lurking ambiguity. And in the open text, all the elements are maximally excited. Here it is because ideas and things exceed without deserting argument that they have taken into the dimension of the work. So I thought that was really resonant with what Marco was just saying. The, um, a single reading of it and being confirmed in that knowing is, you know, that's different than saying there's only one reading of a text or, um, and pointing towards the inexhaustibility of the open text and how that might intersect with the quantum. I think that's a great question. I like that. I'd like to pose a question back to Jeffrey, you, Heather, and anyone else who, who would have something um, um, perhaps to, to say to it, but how does the collective uh, intersubjectivity or um, group subjectivity, uh, how, how does the collective versus the individual or in contrast with the individual uh, relate to the quantum idea? Where does, where does human subjectivity kind of come into it? I think we're still trying to feel our way into that. I mean, uh, uh, um, I think the one of the reasons why I think this approach lends itself to a collective approach is because um, because the quantum field products is focused on how can I say it not rules exactly because we're because we are dealing with open text but but with the this is what I call structures but structures is not an easy word either but the it, it's focused on particular ways of enhancing or working with text uh particular principles maybe of working with text and because those principles can be named and discussed then several people can contribute to them in 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 a collective way and that's that's what we're i think we're it may not be the only way that one can do it but it's certainly one of the ways that we're finding this approach enhances a collective effort in terms of creative activity um it may not be exactly the answer you're looking for but it is the tentative one word that we're we're looking at now i don't know heather if you have any other ideas about how that would work? Well, I was trying to trace some of the language. Um, I thought I had seen you post with this cafe and I couldn't find it about the experiential um, dimension of it. But I was also thinking of the quote I pulled from your, the piece you wrote with Clarice um, about the intimacy, the highlighting that aspect of intimacy. Um, I wanted to kind of find that quote um, I have a lot of thoughts on we spaces, but I don't just want to ramble on about that. Um, other than if a field has objects in it and is composed, you know, like these might be entities, um, eternal entities even. Um, 
they're all going to have an effect on the field. I'm really interested in group mind and how that process works. And then to think about it, bring it back into the language of physics is a move I haven't made. So I don't know really what to say about that. So, so we do have this idea of an experiential field, which doesn't have to be the experiential field of an individual. In fact, one of the, the ideas I've been teasing myself about is, say, Aaron Manning or Whitehead, for that matter, talk about experiential fields in the sense of non-human experiential fields. So whether they're animal experiential fields, but also rocks and mountains and these kinds of things, if you go to Whitehead. So I, I don't know, but it seems to me that there may be some way of teasing out those kinds of experiential fields and not just the sort of obvious human ones as well. But uh, it's, it's an exploratory question right now. I even wonder if my question is just dissolved by the very concept, because if we're thinking in terms of fields, then we're not in the first instance, constructing an individual subject who's conceiving of mm. the poem or authoring the poem by virtue of its own individuality or something like that. It's coming from somewhere else. I think that's, that's part of the point. And it's, there's a different, uh, <laughs> where language becomes difficult, but there's a different mode of consciousness or a different way of relating to reality that allows the perception of meaning outside of one's own con you know, limited subjectivity. That's part of, I think, what this may, may be getting at is, is a, an articulation or a, um, a sharing of, of, of what that is. Uh, I had a term too that I, that I used at one point, um, it still may again, but I, it, was, it was social poetics. I think it relates a bit maybe to this. In so f because it's it's that the poetry doesn't come from me. It, it it comes it comes from us, but it doesn't come from us in the kind of totalitarian mind or group mind in the in the negative sense of that. It has this open quality to it. That's what I think is really compelling and interesting to me about about it is that is that there's not somebody telling me what to think or what to do or um, what to believe. Uh, the the field itself is is suggesting um, ideas to try on, uh, language to play with, uh, feelings I might, I might uh, be able to tune into if I, uh, if I resonate with what you're saying or what somebody else is saying, or if I read this text or another, if we initiate some kind of experiment based on, a, based on something we've read. It's like the, potent, the possibilities that that opens up, which are really interesting to me. I'd like to jump in there when you're done, Marco. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Um, because I think what you're saying, it points us to the A perspectivity, right? All, all that we're kind of moving around here, the A perspectivity aspect of it. And uh, the metaphors that Jeffrey has in his poetics pieces, while they sound scientific when you first encounter them, might be um, shapes that describe the um, emergence of these poems as us um, or the poems that are part whole us and <laughs> me as uh, the person transcribing or writing it down, receiving it. Um, I think something I would add to what you said though about poetry doesn't come from me. There's an open quality to it um, is that there's also a shaping quality to it. So something that I experience a lot is I might recognize there are multiple options open to me at one moment and I have the option to shape that moment with the word I choose. And it actually, it, what's interesting about that is it renders a force, sometimes beyond the text. Sometimes what I'm shaping is actually um, more my life stuff that <laughs> in, the, in the sense that my life and my text might be woven together, the outcome might actually show up on the page in a way that I've interacted with it. Uh, it's a little scary actually, um, sometimes to shape at that edge. Uh, but then I'm thinking of other practices. I think, I feel like practice is the best way to get at what we're talking about here, which things like the minor gesture or the genlin felt sense and carrying forward are ways to tend to this open quality and then shape something that becomes a text. And the text itself could be indeterminate. 
that's what's interesting. I like that idea as well as an expression of this. Oh, and I found the quote <laughs> when there's an open space from Jeffrey uh, that I wanted to read. Well, why don't you read it now? I think we're coming up to our, our deadline for the exercise. Yeah. Thank uh, you. You, were, you had to run out of time. <laughs> Um, so, in a text on quantum poetics by Jeffrey Edwards and Clarisse Tremblay, uh, we find meaningful mediation, meditation on the intersection of space and the intimate, as revealed in a dialogue between science and poetry. The authors say, this profoundly modern observation that perceived reality and the perception process are characteristic of the artistic field. So, the modern observation that perceived reality and the perception process are characteristic of the artistic field was made parallel to the quantum mechanics revolution in physics, which came to a parallel conclusion. The space of intimacy and the space of the physical universe could be postulated to be one and the same. I love that. I think that's beautiful. There, no. <laughs> um, you, did you want to move on to the, an exercise? Um, I don't know how, how people feel about it. I don't want to cut off the discussion in the middle, but uh, um, the idea of the exercise is to give people a kind of a hands-on feel about how the ideas that we're working with might actually work in terms of producing a text. Um, so, uh, it, it, anyway, it's, and we can have some, maybe some more discussion afterwards, after we do the exercise. It's about 25 minutes altogether. Yeah, I, I feel that would be fine for me personally. This, there's, this feels unending, it feels open-ended, and we could talk about this forever. I have ideas I could throw at you now, so we'll, I'm, I'm okay with the exercise, I don't have any pressing to contribute now. Yeah, me too. Let's do the exercise. Okay. Um, so you'll need um, a piece of paper or a couple of pieces of paper to do the exercise. Um, um, I did the exercise myself. So, um, and I'm going to try sharing the screen, but I don't know that I can, but I, I'll try. Uh, share screen. How do I do that? There's a green button at the bottom of your window. It says share, share screen. screen. Oh, yes. Okay. Hey, can you see that? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the exercise is in, to begin with, it's in, let's say, four parts, four to five parts. First thing we're going to do a three minute meditation just to attend to our bodies and our experience. Then we're going to do two minutes in which we write out a series of words on the paper. And I've given you an idea, just write random words around on the paper. Um, the circling is the next step. So after you've written out a series of words on the paper that correspond to your feeling of experience, then you'll circle and link words that you think might be connected, um, which is that part. And then uh, after that, we will be um, rewriting them into lines, essentially. So, uh, so if I took the, whoops, the words from the previous, so child, lighter, uh, for instance, then they get reproduced in this next, um, not sure how to move it ahead now, whoops. So child lighter, you see, so I've, I've, I've turned them into horizontal lines, if you like. And from there, one can actually construct a poem if one wants to, um, in the, in the next. So it's, it's, it's a series of small segments that we're going to follow. So I'd, 
I just wanted to lay out the process to you first. And um, so have we turned off the screen sharing? Is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, we'll, we'll begin with, a, is that clear to you in terms of the process for the first steps? I will repeat them on each step. So uh, the first is a three minute meditation. Uh, where you attend to your own bodies and the, your own experience, your perceptual experience, your grounding in, in, you know, sense of body, sense of space, that kind of thing, even where you are in your day or whatever. Okay, uh, uh, I don't think I have any bells, but uh, I can do. I might have one. Hang on, I think I might have one. I have to look it up. I have a, an app for it. <laughs> Here we are. There you go. Can you hear that? Hang on. Can you hear that? Okay. So first bell and then three minutes later, the second bell.
Okay. So, um, so now for two minutes, write down a series of words across the paper that correspond to your attended field. Across the paper, like linear, or like your paper with random. It, you can do whatever you want, but I suggest random so that you don't. If you want to organize them into lines already, you could do that. Just all over the page. Yeah. Sort of free association or free uh, free flow. And now if you want to link them into, either put circles through them, round them or link them into groups or, or, and, or rewrite them into horizontal clusters. And now if you want to take each of the lines and turn it into a one line sentence that could be a kind of mini poem or a mini part of a poem if you want, it, or it could be just a sentence. It doesn't matter all that much. And don't worry if you're behind in the text, the idea is not to do everything on time, but to, to have a, a sense of the process.
Cross my mind. There it is. Okay, so we're going to take about five minutes to talk about, to share either your text if you want to, or to talk about the process if you have any comments about the process to get to the text. I, uh, it reminds me of uh, a poet in, I believe it's South Carolina, uh, that I knew for a while. Uh, I think I used a, a poem or, or, or something in the first novel I wrote, uh, but she called it, and she was doing this on, on Facebook, a Facebook with friends, and she called it uh, Wednesday Poem. And anybody who wanted to would just post a word, you know, in the comments. And then she would take the collection of single words and make it into a poem. I didn't, I didn't participate, so. And then, uh, then I think she took it and, and published it in a book. quick riff on that there's another similar other similar projects like i forgot what they're called heather would probably know where you black out texts in a existing book like somebody did this with infinite jest they went page by page mm -hmm. and blacked out text to leave poetic fragments that were almost like heather did actually with with the didn't the didn't somebody want to stab it with a knife too and wherever the knife indentation was made a poem out of the words i wouldn't doubt it <laughs> no i think i think if i go back and look at the pictures i think and if you if it's still if it's still on facebook anyway seems to be and, and the process is fairly common for a kind of creative writing context i mean there are similar processes that are used all over the place for this kind of activity Heather had several suggestions. Um, the idea here is not necessarily the process in a general sense, but some of the specifics about process or some of the text that you came up with, you know, so. I think the word Marco, were you looking for redaction? To redact a text? That is the, that names the, that doesn't name, I think the poetic technique or the generative technique but that is what crossing out text the blacking it out yeah mm -hmm. it, is. it does kind of mimic kind of, that uh you know classified kind of information sort of uh look of fbi memos that are all redacted i think that i've just I i've heard it called a redacted text a lot yeah mm, yeah i hadn't thought of the connection there but yeah i i've heard it called censorship <laughs> <laughs> so so what did we all write i'm curious is there was there a field uh phenomena here did, in, in this exercise is that is that part of the uh the intention or the um the hope was it was it duplicate words is that what was is do you mean no just what did you write what were some of the examples of words that you wrote I'll read what I wrote, but I, I, it's not good. It just was what I strung together. So with that disclaimer, silly, silly steel full of madness. Trump Loy, I cannot say that word. Trump, <laughs> Trump, Trump Loy? Yeah, story, <laughs> Trump Loy, story I defect. Eager trace, my gelatinous form of humble French, a distracted foe, tres ami. 
Childlike what? crucible, frigid, stern, a playground of form. If we get a few others to read, we'll know if there's more of a field effect, maybe. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. I, I'm not, Johnny knows I don't like showing my drawings, but I'm going, <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'll show that, I don't know if you can see this, but these are the words up here that I, I tried to link together, okay? And, the, and working from the top down, I'll just say what the words were. Why, crow, learning, no, sorrow, child, talk, question. So those will no, go. No with a K? No. Negative. No, as I just spoke. <laughs> Negative no. <laughs> well, that, that, that'll become clearer <laughs> when, I, when I read what I, what I write, okay? I'll read what I read. Why is there no learning without sorrow? The child asks. The crow speaks. No. Why is no the most important word we learn? That was mine. I like it. <laughs> so I happened to be staring out at a field, so I, I was. Uh, <laughs> Is that where I more, heard the crow? <laughs> I, I think I was on mute, so that might have been a, a <laughs> okay. Jeff, Jeff I heard a crow there. right before we went into meditation. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping a crow would land on a tree here, do some Wallace Stephen action or something. But, um, so there's a lot of clouds passing by. My first word was Cloud Atlas, which is a book by David Mitchell. But anyways, I'll read my words. Um, Flutter, Cloud Atlas, Onomatopoeia anticipation, walking, emptiness, yet, ant, sweat bee, and experience. And a lot of things linked up with experience and emptiness, right? Just the way they were laid out on the page there. But um, with my simple mind, I came up, up with a haiku style, which once I went back and looked at it, oh, it doesn't match the syllable structure. But uh, sweat bee was left out completely just because it didn't seem to fit at the end. But that was the observer. It was sitting on one of my, my uh, phone here, just sort of moving its tail or its thorax, whatever it's called. And Anabhadapiya was the title. So it's Cloud Atlas Flutter, Walking Anticipation, Ant Experience, Emptiness, Yet. So far, no common words. So there is a second part to the exercise, um, which was to do the same thing, but now to be attentive to, so I know we didn't get to everybody, but um, the idea is to just get a general sense and then move on. So um, you'll get a chance later on if you want, Johnny. <laughs> so the idea now is to pay attention to the field as it emerge. And and also any sense of body space, but not necessarily just your own body, but also comments that came up about the bodies from other people, if, if, there are, if you notice anything like that. So uh, paying attention to the collective field and the collective physical sense. And then we'll do another three minute meditation and then we'll, we'll compress the steps for the exercise so that you do them quickly and get to a kind of a text at the end that, that expresses something about the collective field. Okay. So I'll start the bell.
So I gave you six minutes for the exercise earlier. I'm going to give you four to go through the steps again. So that's four minutes. I didn't take part in the first round because uh, I had so much things to manage just to keep everything on the track, but this time around I did participate. So I'm happy to read my text first. <laughs> so mine says, outside in the cloudy fields, there are no crows, only eyes which squeeze shut in puzzlement. Mm -hmm. 
I like that, Jeffrey. Let me let me share the second stanza to the first one. <laughs> In silence do the clouds sail by. The crow asks, the child speaks, no, as if it were an unpronounceable foreign word. I'd like to reflect on how my process was different this time. I noticed, um, I wrote down things like we notice um, and I found myself drawn to see the call itself as an object or to think of Doug's field as a field of effects. And so I feel like my attention in doing this second part was drawn to group noticing, if that's a thing. <laughs> Any other comments or um, about this exercise? Or about the exercise in general? Well, I enjoyed it. I don't think I did it correctly, though. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize. I sort of, I wrote something down, but it it just turned into a, a really yucky narrative. <laughs> I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm very stimulated by this, this field effect, by the whole experience, so thank you. Floor still open for comments. Um, I don't think I wrote anything that good. Uh, something kind of came together. I sort of have just like these partial strands of linguini on, on the page. There are, there are connections. It just hasn't become coherent. Um, but there, there were three lines I liked out of what I wrote and that came together. I don't know if they constitute a kind of little nugget. To me, this would just be a, a like a, a, um, a, a small unit, a meme that, that could be used somewhere or maybe, or maybe not. But I wanted to talk about how poetry is truth, like that we're not just making shit up, that there's something like Aurobindo would call truth force or truth consciousness that poetry is about. I didn't know how to get to that. Uh, and so uh, I just began by writing poetry is truth. The plain assertion of that for what that's worth, not much. Um, slowness in construction, because part of I think what I, part of my difficulty with a process like this is that it's too fast. I, I tend to need a lot more time to, to be with the kind of messiness of these words and to find um, clusters of, of significance, things that words that group together and mean something and that could be strung together. So there's con a construction that is very slow and laborious. And so slowness and construction, lightning in effect. Poetry is truth, slowness and construction, lightning in effect. And I was kind of thinking about, uh, I was thinking about Mark Twain, who said that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is like the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. And I think, I think that this may have some relation to the topic because part of the idea of the text crystallizing, like forming, 
out of the quantum foam that you get a determinant text. What makes that the right word versus the almost right word? And that's to me the magic of when poetry works is that it's precisely the right word. If it were another word, it wouldn't work. I think that's what Heather was also hinting at earlier with respect to the care that sometimes one must take between, you know, in, in one's choice of words, because they'll, they'll have different effects and those, the downstream effects of those words, you know, can multiply. Um, I think that's kind of what's at stake in the poetic project is finding the right words. And, and those are the words that operate so deeply that um, they kind of determine, they, they, they give those initial boundaries to the field, I think. Um, so so I, it's, it's worth taking our time with, with our poetics, that is my, my feeling. Um, and uh, yeah, um, this is very interesting. This is very, and, and you know, there's also just last, like the messiness is allow the affordance or the allowance for that uh, is is really important too. I think, and it's something that in our culture, civilization doesn't tend to really be given the, the time or respect that that it needs. I think so. I appreciate this act, this uh, attempt. So obviously, the process is rushed. <laughs> And none of us write poetry this way. <laughs> um, in French, we have this term. It it means the right word, but it's le mot juste. But le mot juste means almost not just the right word, but the just word. You know, it has this other sense to it, which is interesting. I mean, right also has another sense to it as well. But uh, um, I, I, I I definitely agree that the right word is special <laughs> and hardly easy to come up with. <laughs> In fact, it might be the animo, <laughs> the animated word. <laughs> so that's it for the exercise. Um, a couple of things I wanted you to be aware of, you probably were, but obviously I insisted on body grounding. So this is part of what we believe that quantum poetics is, is partly about. It's not just abstract thinking. It's also about being attentive to what's going in the body. So when we talk about the experiential field that we're trying to get at, experiential field is very much a body-based and embodied sense of the field and not just ideas or memories that don't have a body sense. So um, the structure, so um, Ed's, second, Ed's poem versus my poem, you're right, they form a kind of stanza one and stanza two and they're both, they're not quite haiku but they're they have a little bit of the haiku feeling to them, right? And they have interesting resonances between those two poems, um, obviously because of the field effect that we generated from the discussion. So this is part of what we're talking about when we're talking about how structure engages resonance, right? So it, without the structures, you wouldn't get, without the similar structures, you wouldn't get the same resonance between those two texts. Uh, so the structure has a connection to the to the uh, resonance. And one of the things that I didn't get into, um, uh, Heather mentioned, uh, um, we talked about uh, Lee Jarno's uh, presentation about field, and it's very interesting. It's a it's a short podcast style so it's just audio and you listen to it and it's not that long but it does give you a better sense of how the interconnectedness in languages are field effects and how they express themselves and um, um, one of the things she mentions very quickly and it's also in my text is that 
distance matters. That is to say, if, if you have a word and you the word next to it, they have a stronger connection than a word and a word that's much further away, like several sentences away, they have almost no connection. The only reason they have a connection is if you repeat the structure, if the same structure in one sentence is repeated in a much later structure, then they are now connected because they're reinforced by this repetition. But otherwise, the resonances being words have to do with locality and not just um, presence. So this is another interesting field effect in the context of field poetics or quantum poetics or whatever. And the uh, uh, final thing I wanted to say about the quantum poetics and coming a little bit back to the discussion with Ed um, about, uh, you know, is it worth going through all the physics in order to do this kind of thing? Um, my interest in the quantum f f physics is, and, and maybe this is obvious, but because a lot of people, when they talk about quantum physics, they talk about teleportation and entanglement and these issues because they're the sort of sexy ones that are out in the public eye. But I tend to think that the interest between poet, poetry and physics has nothing to do with these things. It has to do with the principles underlying physics. And this is what I'm attempting to do is to identify the principles in physics that could be adapted and applied in an interesting way to um, literary text um, and not these sort of bugaboos that are in the general popular discussion about quantum physics, which they're interesting, but um, they're hard to, to address in the, in the literary sense. But the idea of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle applied to literature is hugely interesting and and then the idea of you know even i had a, a short text about local gauge invariance and its possible application to literature eh, it's pushing it but it's it's interesting because it makes you think about sentence structure differently than you did before and i think that's interesting about modifying how we think about sentences and how we work with sentences and when we're writing so I thought I might finish with another quote from one of my texts, if you don't mind. Um, I am in search of the other, exquisite pleasure and masculine enjoyment. You report it to me crackling and clinging to your aura. If I could annihilate space-time to reach you, your lines of force will go along the geodetic curves of my body, they will burn me with a fine and dry pain. But you infiltrate me in droplets. I feel your madness in, your, in my blood. You invade me like an infection. Make me follow you, follow you in two narrow interior spaces in the sub-geometries of your rage. I know you said it, it's not sexy, but that, that sounded pretty sexy to me. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to close with a note that this, this helps ground me in the discussion between you and Ed um, for the thread that you and Heather have put together. I, I made it through one or two of the videos and then I just got overwhelmed with other, like I said, it's either everlasting, non-ending, or just too open-ended of a concept and this this at least the principles and uh, the grounding will help me when I get to exploring that that once again so thank you oh, are we making um, summary statements here I think so I think we're wrapping we're, up, we're okay. wrapping up. So, so just very briefly uh, I'm looking forward to looking at this uh, program again on the video um, because I want to I want to find out when in the video I spaced out because I got lost in the field and um, 
I'm just, start, I'm just starting to come back. And it doesn't make me feel ungrounded at all, because this is actually a very familiar feeling, getting lost in the field. <laughs> but it, does, it is a perturbation. And I did notice that I, a sort of strategy started to emerge, because I was interested in the, as I was listening to uh, Heather and, um, and, your, and your presentation, um, I started to think about the field effect and quantum, the little bit I know about quantum theory and the, the nature of the observer. And I was wondering about how is the observer different from the other? And I thought about that uh, as I sort of, and then I sort of went into the field and I didn't feel like I had a very strong center. But um, I started to sense that there is a future in which I believe that this, uh, what, what's got started can s sort of reach a fruition. And I believe there will be an observer, a future observer, and I picked Aurobindo. And there will be a future other, and I picked an ex-lover, Tony. And there will be a future self. So I think that the, the, the work that got started today, it's going somewhere. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to just be like a, go into the laboratory with this. Thanks. And on, we can continue on this, on this on the forum too. If something comes up, we can continue writing about this. I hope others will as well. So Johnny, when you mentioned, um, I don't know if you started to space out when I was presenting, but I kind of felt, um, I think I might have felt that I could that's why I apologize for so many quotes I wasn't sure if it was the de density or layered nature of the quotes so I felt I felt something drop away <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think anything was wrong yeah but I spaced out didn't bother me particularly I just wish I could be a little more I had, the, that's all. I had, I had that a little bit too a little in and out and noticing yeah just a lot of yeah a lot going on there yes thank you Oops. These are fairly abstract concepts that we're working with. I mean, I, just the nature of the material I, is, um, I, I don't know that it's difficult, I'm, it, it, but I think it lends itself to um, um, spacing out <laughs> to, to that sort of getting the puzzled with, or, or, or almost left at an impasse. It's not an impasse though, because it doesn't have uh, I mean, there's something so optional about this, right? There's, there's whether we write a good poem here or not, or whether something comes together or not, is uh, I hope not going to change the destiny of the universe. Uh, so, um, so there, there, there's a way in which you can, I think, hang out and um, you know. A, 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 allow the uncertainty to gestate. I mean, that, that I think is maybe one of the um, practical insights or lessons we could draw is that there's a, import, there's a room, there's importance to indeterminacy and to um, not knowing and to fuzziness as well, uh, to, to the clouds of probability rather than the concretion of certainty, that that is, inherent to, or could be in, seen as, or experienced as, or affirmed as inherent to a creative process. And so, insofar as we're uh, participating in a larger creative process, um, I, 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 I'm, I feel, I'm very, I'm very uh, receptive to, to this kind of work. And it, it, it feels relevant um, to, things that are more, you know, less optional, that feel less optional, that feel that uh, I really have to uh, pay attention to them, give attention to them. And so, I don't know if that's clear at all, what, what I'm saying, but um, um, I look forward to seeing where this is going because we're, we're gonna continue working together on this. And it's become for me a prompt to, um, to spend more time in the indeterminate and to um, like almost develop a relationship there where I, I can um, work 
through some of the confusion, some of the knots that I feel, because there's energy in those in there as well. And I feel it in my body. I feel, I feel like knots of energy in my, my gut, my left side, especially. Um, and, and I know that when I um, become attentive to those and allow them to relax and speak, they often have something interesting to say, but I have to allow it. So those are my closing reflections. And thank you, uh, Heather and Jeffrey, for organizing this. I found it a very interesting little get together, answered uh, my, my couple of open questions that I had. I didn't respond to your last post, uh, Jeffrey, not because I didn't have anything to say, <laughs> <Oddly enough. laughs> but because I didn't want to preempt or maybe misdirect where we might be going with uh, what's, what, what happened this evening. Um, I, th I thought it was enough. I was trying to get some the initial posts put down in the field, so to speak. And I'll talk in corral terms there. Um, to get an idea of where we were headed with this and and, and, and a, a lot of a lot of my primary questions and the subsidiary and, and knock on questions that come from those uh, did, get, did get answered this evening so that was uh, I and since I didn't have to draw a picture <laughs> I could just spread some words around that was that made it easier for me so, so thanks thanks to both of you. <laughs> I did have pictures, drawings in the exercise, but I took them out because I found it confusing. So I made it just words. But <laughs> And one of the things we didn't say on the preface was that, uh, anyway, I, it felt slightly premature to bring this to the cafe at this point uh, because we're still feeling our way into it as a subject. But... Um, Marco and Johnny and other people were really interested in the subjects. And so we thought, well, even if it's not ready, we'll bring it forward and see what comes out of it. So uh, it has been really useful to bring, including the discussion with you, Ed, uh, it's been really useful to sort of clear some of the ideas about this as a group. So a field effect, again, in the development of this, these ideas. Well, I thought there was, for me, a lot of intensity in this exercise. So that's some feedback. It was, um, it was spacing out, but with intensity. So there's a, a, something for me to learn here. And thank you very much for this opportunity. So I'm going to go. My eye is, um, needs to rest, so. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey, for including me in these, uh, bringing me into this work. So it's been really interesting. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Feel better, Jeffrey. Yeah, <laughs> please do. See you next time. Feels, feel quickly. <laughs>